Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the official Getting Into Games podcast. Uh, each week, we talk to a games industry professional about their long, windy, and twisty journeys into the games industry, how they got there, and what it is that they do. Today, I'm joined by the amazing Heather Bishop over at Game Anglia. How are you doing, Heather? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah I'm good, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing bad. And, you know, as we said before this, that I was very much looking forward to the weekend already, which is bad at nine o'clock on Wednesday morning, but it, that, that, that's fine. That's fine. You know, we'll, we'll power on through and we'll get there. Exactly. I mean, you've got to be fairly optimistic about the weekend, you know, that's why it's the end of the week. Exactly, exactly. It's something good to look forward to. And I've got some nice plans as well. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing a few people, seeing a few friends, hopefully going to go out and do some stuff. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, I'm going to get off <laughs> talking about me. This is about you. <laughs> So I have a few questions, I think, just to kick us off. It would be really, really great if you just told us a little bit about yourself and what you do over at Game Anglia. Um, sure. I'm Heather. I did a degree in game design at University of Suffolk in Ipswich. Um, and I joined Game Anglia in 2017 as a volunteer. So Game Anglia is an, it's an events company, but we're essentially trying to promote the industry in the east of England. Um, I joined as a volunteer and worked on their first conference and then they seemed to quite like me so they asked me if I wanted to essentially co-coordinate the indie showcase which is an opportunity for indie developers to showcase their games for free with us um, and I did that and I must have done fairly well because they then sort of said oh do you want to be a director now and I said well go on then that sounds like a nice idea <laughs> um, yeah and here we are in 2020 and they haven't got rid of me yet <laughs> Brilliant. Amazing. Amazing. So, so how did that kind of come about finding out about Game Anglia? They've been around for a long time uh, when you, when you started joining them? No, Green Around the Gills in 2017. Um, so it was quite nice because we all kind of grew together. So that worked out really nicely. Um, essentially, one of my co-directors, Chris, was an alumni from Suffolk as well. And he sort of decided, OK, we're going to have the event in university of suffolk because he's got connections and stuff and it was just a nice little safety net for the first event <laughs> um and then um that was kind of how i met the course lead introduced us and sort of said to chris oh she's she's a capable human being get her to help you <laughs> brilliant brilliant and um so how did kind of game anglia come about it was chris and mark's baby um and i just kind of joined later <laughs> Um, I think it all started, they were having a conversation, um, probably in the pub, you know, because we are game developers after all, um, <laughs> about how there was no events in the local region and that kind of led to the fact that there's no developers as such in the region. Like There are a few very brave individuals <laughs> who are kind of plugging away at it, but it's not the industry and the community isn't what it should be considering how big the industry is in general. Um, and they just decided they were going to be the go-getters to go change that. Brilliant. And it certainly seems like they have, you know, it feels like there's a really strong presence now around kind of um, the East Anglia kind of region around game development. And, you know, for anyone who's perhaps a young person or a student coming through at either BTEC or university level, there's an organization now there that they can reach out to. There's a whole big network there of game developers. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then, um, cause there's a couple of other kind of companies that have sprung up as well. Um, and we all try to maintain quite a nice collaborative, um, community environment because there's enough of us to go around. We just need to be nice to each other, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got to help each other out. So, so, uh, for anyone who's listening that doesn't know, I'd love you to kind of talk through what a co-director does. What sort of things do you do as you kind of coordination role co-director role at game Anglia. um so <laughs> i i have organized events um which kind of ranges from lots of emails lots of phone calls lots of organizing people and making sure they're kind of where they need to be at the right times um contacting developers contacting speakers and that kind of thing um and then just a small disclaimer i am I am the best at admin. <laughs> admin is my superpower. So um, I very quickly kind of took over managing the books, the policies, the procedures, and making sure that all of our paperwork was in line. <laughs> I mean, it's not very glamorous, but I just, it's my thing. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, I wish that I was good at that. I'm absolutely terrible at all of that stuff. I just forget about it until the last moment and then have to do it all at once. So definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was our story in 2017. <laughs> 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 um, 
um but yeah i mean that's that's essentially it and then if there is an event kind of live and happening right now depending on the nature of the event um it's talking to lots of people making sure they're okay making sure they have what they need um and that any visitors are having a good time so a bit of problem solving and troubleshooting and stuff i'd imagine you can empathize yeah absolutely no that makes a lot of sense to me that's pretty much where i uh where i lie as well that sort of thing so for any kind of young person out there who's interested in perhaps pursuing something around like events coordination, perhaps even the admin side of stuff as well, the sort of role that you do at, at Game Anglia, what sort of skills should they be looking out for? What are some of the real top things that, that you feel that you bring to your role at Game Anglia? Um, so self-management straight off the bat. <laughs> so at Game Anglia, we do check in on each other and make sure that we're okay and that things are going well with task wise, but nobody's got the time to kind of dedicate three hours each week to making sure that we've all done what we said we were going to do and so on. Um, so you need to be fairly autonomous in prioritizing and selecting your tasks and how they relate to the event that's happening. Um, and then you need to be organized enough that you've actually put them in your schedule and you've actually done them. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds really self-explanatory, but it's something that very easily snowballs into I've got a thousand things to do in three days to do them. <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd probably say communication as well. I mean, it doesn't matter what job you're going for. Communication is a big one. Um, but for event coordination and that level of things, it can range from instructions to explanations to people and to feedback on what they have done or haven't done. And you have to be speaking to your team all the time. Everyone needs to know what's going on, where it's happening and for how long it's happening. Um, nobody should ever have to be chasing you for information on when um, that document's going to be ready or if it's more kind of in the industry, when that 3D model is going to be done, you know, and you shouldn't have any difficulty or issues telling them in a very useful and effective way because that's kind of the next side of that coin like the way you disseminate that information is quite important yeah no definitely i, I think that's some um, really important skills that perhaps don't get talked about a lot in uh, when you're learning game development you know some of those soft skills around kind of coordination kind of self-organization and management um and like time management as well and just like really being efficient with with your time and and also like that coordination with other people as well like communication with other people knowing what to say and when how you say it all of those sort of skills i think are hugely hugely important in kind of like general project management especially i think in game development really really important yeah very much so i mean my when i did my degree um i couldn't tell you how many turd games are in my wake because we just didn't know how to communicate with each other we didn't know how to organize our time and you you sprint to the deadline and the finish line and then you kind of get there and you realize oh well we didn't really do that very well did we <laughs> we were limping the whole time and we didn't even know <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's one of those things, you know, it's a bit of a learning curve, right? You have to like fail at it lots of times first before you, um, before you feel, before you learn these things, you know, and like, it's, um, yeah, you just, it's just trial and error. And I think that's one of the great things about kind of, um, uh, game jam specifically that I think are really, really great that you kind of just like, you have to just fail over and over and over again. And so much of the part of the process of that is just like getting things wrong. And then sometimes, you know, those things that you get wrong end up actually being the thing that is most fun about the game, or, you know, you create some crazy thing out of it and you just, yeah, complete kind of trial and error over and over and over again. Absolutely. So, so I'd love to know a little bit more about um, kind of Game Anglia at the moment, where you guys are at, kind of what's coming next for you, what kind of projects you have going on. Basically, yeah, what, what's, what's the future look like for Game Anglia? Busy. <laughs> so um, we're trying to get off a really, really big indie showcase in hopefully Ipswich, um, but obviously COVID has kind of put a bit of a pin in that one. <laughs> um, so we're just figuring out if we're going to move that online or if we're going to really try to do the push for an in-person event and um, ensure that everything's socially distanced and how that's going to work. Um, I'm going to cough, bear with me one second. <laughs> um, what else have we got? So we've got... Um, 
the Kratis program, which we're running with Colchester Borough Council. So we're essentially putting together a bunch of uh, smaller webinars for uh, creative um, entrepreneurs, basically. Um, so we've had all sorts of bits and pieces with them. So dealing with the imposter syndrome, how to pitch um, business planning for people who don't like business planning, which is probably something we should have gone to back in 2017. <laughs> but it didn't exist, so we couldn't. Um, what else have we got? So we've got um, a program that we're possibly about to launch called the Lift Foundation. Um, it's in collaboration with Norfolk County Council and Suffolk County Council. And it's basically a short course um, for people not in education or employment to help them get into education or employment. Obviously, we're focusing on the games industry because that's where our expertise lies. But yeah, so it should take you step by step through making a game and then launching amazing that sounds like a really really great project hopefully i mean we've got some fantastic support around us so i think we'll be okay um and we're quite excited to get it started because it's it's a difficult thing like particularly if you didn't manage to go through the formal route of education, you didn't manage to get your GCSEs and so on and so forth, then you kind of find yourself in a bit of a difficult situation when you then try to go to college or university afterwards. Um, and then jobs are quite slim because you don't have any qualifications and you can't get the experience because you don't have the qualifications. It's a very weird circular thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. It's a complete kind of catch-22 and, and something that's, yeah, a, a problem much wider than the games industry, but something that I think, you know, particularly resonates with the industry. You know, it's hugely, really highly educated um, and there's not really many pathways in for anyone who doesn't fit the bill for that. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons kind of why that happens. You know, it's, industry's grown so quickly, you know, there's not really, there hasn't been any kind of like formalized roots into the industry and people, I guess, like when they started kind of legitimizing like games design degrees, that became the kind of predominant route to get in. And now it's just the way that everyone goes. And you know, it's so I think 90% of the industry, you know, it's got, got at least one degree. So there's really, really not many pathways outside of that. And I think that, you know, what this project that really sounds like an opportunity for those who don't have that formal higher education to really get like tangible games design experience. And, and it seems like actually, like that is one of the things that's most important to kind of game studios is like portfolio. It's a body of work and it's just more often than not, university is is setting you up for creating that body of work but if there was perhaps another route in or another way or another support network like like you guys are creating then potentially there could be some young people coming out with some really cracking amazing portfolios that haven't had to go through that kind of conventional academic system right yeah absolutely um that's the dream anyway uh and it also would mean that people who people who don't thrive in a traditional academic circle situation are gonna be just as I'll rephrase that they're going to have just as much opportunity to pursue what they want to pursue as anybody else so i mean <laughs> um i always thrived quite a lot in an academic environment but most of my friends did not so when we went to college they took very practical subjects um and they enjoyed those subjects but then it kind of left when we left it meant that i was kind of earning significantly more money from them than them and yet we were essentially doing a job that was equally as difficult because we were both in graduate positions and it just made no sense whatsoever. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. The system kind of like um, afford, afford, is afforded more towards um, kind of those who do the kind of conventional kind of academic subjects than it is that those, those that do practical. And it means that especially, which is, you know, there's how, however many um, young people study in like BTECs and HNCs and HNDs up in Scotland, uh, which is just a so much more kind of practical kinesthetic learning experience that suits so many young people better. Often those are young people that were kind of let down by our kind of, um, education system before that because again it's very classroom based it's very academic it's very head down get on with your work and this is an opportunity for them to to kind of try something different and try a new learning approach that is much more hands-on and much more project-based and then it seems strange that ne then from that the next step onwards is to go back into the classroom and go to university again after they've just spent those two years kind of unlearning all that and relearning how to do things in that kind of much more practical really industry informed way it's quite strange yeah yeah and it's it's quite difficult as well because um d disclaimer i have a, i have a day job and that is actually teaching at a university <laughs> um and a lot of my kind of more mature students they find that 
sort of coming back to education very difficult and then the kind of the bars to entry they had to hurdle and then they kind of get there and then they're in a room with a bunch of 18 to sort of 21 year olds and they sort of look around and they're like oh okay (laughs) and it can be really difficult for them to readjust back to that mentality um I'm not sure I could no no definitely not it feels a bit easier going fresh from fresh from school when it's been drilled into you it's a totally different setting I think you know what actually I, I do think probably I would have done better because I think I would have been better prepared for it I've know, known what to expect whereas you know, I think when I was when I was 18 19 I think I was more worried about other things than I was about um how well I did at my degree <laughs> I mean freshers week was always a fan favorite <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly exactly I was looking forward to that than I was looking for, more looking forward to my uh, subjects and my classes for sure I think we're all guilty of that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. So so kind of having worked with Game Anglia and having worked with uh, you, the university students that you work with, you've kind of had quite a lot of experience of, you know, what it's like for a young person today to try and navigate getting into the industry uh, and really kind of sit there as that kind of support for them. What advice would you give to a young person who's looking to get into the industry? It kind of links back to um, your point earlier, fail faster. Um, Find find whatever you enjoy or whatever your contribution to our society is going to be on a kind of macro or a micro level um, and then fail at it. Fail at it as quickly and as much as you can. Keep a record of everything that you've made as a result of all these failures. Put those on your portfolio um, because through that failure, you'll find success and you will get better at getting to the success. Um, Yeah, (laughs) I think that would be my general advice. Yeah, no, I think that's really great. I think that's really, really good advice. And you mentioned there around kind of like showing that you've made mistakes and got improved in in your portfolio. Portfolio seems something that's hugely, hugely powerful and really, really important when kind of getting your first job or going to university. Do you have any advice around kind of portfolio building from the experience you've had working with students and the people that you've worked with at Game Anglia? put everything on there even if you're a bit ashamed of it don't don't be ashamed it doesn't matter that you made something three years ago that was a bit naff what matters is where you are now compared to there and if we can see your journey as a human being throughout this thing then that's a lot more illuminating for us um and i know it is for employers within the industry as well um it's not just about who you are now it's about who you were and how you got here Okay, that's really interesting. You know, I've heard actually quite a few different differing yeah. opinions around the por- around kind of portfolio building. And some people say really just like slim it down and have just maybe a couple best pieces in there. Some people kind of say similar to you and some people say in the middle, I guess it really just depends on the employer as well. And I think that's actually one of the things that's come up as well is like, think about who, where you're applying to, you know, think about who, who the studio is, think about what type of work they do, think about what sorts of things that they're going to want to see and kind of tailor it almost to, to what you think they're going to want, basically. Yeah, I think that's probably really good, safe advice, to be honest with you. Um, because I suppose the other side of that coin is that when you're doing a recruitment drive and you're trying to go through a bunch of portfolios, you don't have endless time um and you need to kind of get a bit of a measure of who someone is very quickly so have all of your kind of core projects that you're really proud of and you really want to showcase or that you think the company is really going to like on the kind of home page but then always have the other stuff available on other pages so that they could see them if they wanted to maybe yeah yeah no i like that i th- I really like that kind of sentiment around being able to see someone's developmental journey and, and realize that you know perhaps in quite short space time space of time as well they've improved and developed and built up a new repertoire of skills i think that shows that you're like adaptable and very adept to learning new things and i don't think is necessarily a bad thing to be able to show how far you've come in such a short space of time yeah yeah and it's, it's quite nice at parties and things as well because you kind of pull out your portfolio for cringe fodder it's great it's great <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i've had a few actually students that i've worked with before that kind of feel quite cringy about showing kind of some of their older stuff but it's quite funny to look back and, and see some of the like crazy 3d models and stuff like that that people have made that at the time when they first started obviously they were just like i can't believe i've made this like amazing kind of piece of work and they look back and they're like oh, well yeah. done." <laughs> yeah my uh my job interview for where i'm currently employed was much like that and i uh sat in the interview and sort of showcased some of the things that i've made and then my interviewer sort of turned around and said oh can we can we go to page one please no no 
<laughs> and I did and he sort of was really fabulous about it but I sort of thought no please don't see my secret shame no <laughs> <laughs> very funny very very funny so I'd, I'd love you to kind of take me back Heather all the way back to when you were first kind of studying games design what inspired that and what was your path getting into games you know what what was that career journey like for you and perhaps maybe how have things changed in, even in that short space of time um, so I, I decided at about 13, 14 that I wanted to help people. That was my mission in life. That's what I wanted to do. Um, so I very quickly kind of fixated on the idea that I was going to become a nurse in the military. And uh, due to some personal circumstances, that dream was just very apparent. It became really apparent to me that that wasn't realistic. Um, and I floundered for quite a few years and video games really, really got me through those difficult times. Um, and then I don't really know, sometime around, well, I was about 24, I think. So I was a mature student. Um, I uh, decided that I was going to go and do a degree in games, that I could use games to help people as I'd originally intended. Um, and I, I quite impulsively, I think, decided to go to university. It wasn't, it wasn't something I sat down and thought about for a long time. It was more, okay, I found the thing. I'm going to go do it now. Um, so I did. So I went, I did my degree. Um, and then sometime in my third year, it really occurred to me, what am I going to do for money after all this? Because I'm, I'm a bit too contrary, I think, to make someone else's vision. So in my third year, this kind of real deep panic set in and I kind of thought, oh no, <laughs> I'm going to starve after this. What am I going to do for money? Um, but I was really, really fortunate and I had already been working with Game Anglia for a year and um, through that I met some really lovely people and I managed to get into education and I didn't anticipate staying in education, but then it really just kind of ticked that box for me. You know, I was helping a bunch of students achieve their dreams and their vision. And I don't know, it just, it stuck. And I really loved my job. <laughs> and then Game Anglia fulfilled that as well for me. So I get, to, I get to be greedy and I get to do two things that I love and then develop on the side and make things that I want to make. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's the absolute dream. It's the absolute dream for sure. And, and it feels like, you know, you fulfilled that dream there around wanting to help people and you've managed to marry something that, you know, you really love with something that you were kind of deeply passionate about doing. I know that I kind of certainly feel the same way as well. It feels like a really nice marrying of the two. And I think we've actually managed to find ourselves in kind of quite a sweet spot where there actually aren't that many organizations out there or opportunities to be able to do that, to say that we get to, you know, talk about games as we are now and work in games, but at the same time kind of fulfill that thing of just wanting to be able to I guess like amplify other people's voices right you know I, I kind of feel similarly I don't know if I could work on someone else's vision but I quite like the idea of like amplifying someone else so that they can create their vision you know yeah it's, it's an amazing feeling I'm, I'm so grateful for every person that has come to me afterwards and said okay I've made this game and I'm actually really happy with it and hopefully eventually they'll say I made this game and it got me a job at wherever i'm really looking forward to that yeah absolutely and i'm sure that you're going to see so many people coming through the game anglia pipeline that are like going into amazing jobs in the industry and you know it's uh for yeah, everyone always says but for a big industry it's such a small industry and you know that you're going to end up seeing these people again right oh i really hope so amazing amazing so you talked there before about uh kind of how games had gotten you through some of those tougher times which yeah. leads us on really really well to some of the other questions i feel like with these ones i'm always kind of like not sure how to go about asking them because it's going off the assumption i suppose that everyone who works in the games industry plays games which just isn't actually true at all and something that i actually try and quite a lot to tell people that isn't the case you know there's loads of artists out there who work in the games industry specifically because it get, lets them work on really huge diversity of projects and like really kind of flex their creativity in an interesting way that other creative arts don't get uh, let them do um but they're not necessarily big gamers but you've already solved that for me and said that you were playing games so that's great <laughs> so it means that i can answer, ask those questions and i don't have to worry about uh putting you on the on, on the spot well i perhaps will put you on the spot anyway but <laughs> go for it I'm, I'm ready let's do this <laughs> okay great so you're stranded on a desert island you've got a plug socket well so you probably need two plug sockets for a tv and a console 
and you can take one game with you. What game are you bringing with you? It doesn't necessarily need to be a favorite game, but think about what game you'd want to be playing on the desert island, knowing that it's the only game you've got. Oh, that'd be a difficult one. I think, strangely, I think I would go Age of Empires or Empire Earth. Yeah. Just to I... make a weird one. <laughs> No, no, I think Age of Empires is great. I just got like infinite replayability. I think you can go play hundreds and hundreds of hours of Age of Empires and never get bored. Yeah, I think it was a strategic choice because my, my kind of runner up was The Last of Us because it doesn't matter how many times I play that game, I just can't stop loving it. <laughs> but I think you, you, after say 300, 400 playthroughs, you'd be a bit bored of it. But Age of Empires, you've, you've got some replayability in there. I think so. I think if you played The Last of Us three or 400 times, you'd be quite a spiteful person by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the resentment between Joel and Ellie would be just feverish. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, and then it forbid, you know, I don't know if you if you played the second one, but I'm just playing through that now. If you played that three or four hundred times, wow, you really would be a hateful person. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much. So. I, I don't want to meet the person who's played that three hundred times. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not what you call to have faith in humanity or um, any kind of joy, really. Is it? It's not a go-to game. No, <laughs> keep you sane on a desert island. No, absolutely not. Age of Empires, I think that's a great, great answer. Really, really great answer. So much, so much um, game time in there. You know, you can really just get lost in that for sure. Okay. So many hours of my childhood. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, hours well spent. Oh, yeah. It's not a waste. Never a waste. <laughs> okay. Second question. This one, again, is another one that I've asked so many people and I've never once had a repeated answer. And I'm sure it will be the same again, especially <laughs> given your answer for the last one. So if you had the opportunity to work on any game, this could have been a game that came out years ago. It could be a game that's coming out now. It could be a game that's in the future or even perhaps a sequel to a game that you wished had been made and, and never was. Uh, you have the opportunity to work on the development team for that game. What game is it and why? Oh, okay. I think, oh, I don't think this is going to be a very different answer to the ones you've had before, but I think I would go The Last of Us purely because I have, I have a very deep uh, emotional connection to this game because it was one of the first games that I ever bought for myself. Um, so it came to me at a time in my life when it was the first time I'd ever really been able to afford new games um and triple a games and kind of i played it through and <laughs> um the first time i played it through it was a really really terrible slog because i was living with my mum <laughs> and um she's not she's not a gamer so she doesn't have that intrinsic understanding that when the headphones are on don't come and knock him <laughs> So she ruined quite a few of the really big plot points for me so then when i went and played it through the second time i I kind of hit the emotional experiences that Naughty Dog intended for me, but I had a much more kind of, oh, I see how you put that together level of respect for it than I think you naturally would. And so as a result, I kind of have this very fangirly infatuation <laughs> with The Last of Us. So um, Naughty Dog, if you're listening, uh, hit me up. I'm, I'm available for design work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think it's a great answer. And you know what? This is the first repeated answer. So um, unfortunately, we're going to have to end it right here. <laughs> I have failed. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we only have ever had that once before, but it's absolutely a brilliant, brilliant answer. And <laughs> It, it really is a fantastic game and and that you know that's actually something that i feel like i've noticed as well over the last few few months of playing games is actually looking at them at them through that different lens that i hadn't before you know i felt like i like studied film and felt like i looked at films in in that way but hadn't looked at games in that way until maybe the last year and, and it definitely does give you a newfound appreciation for them for sure when you have the opportunity to kind of step back a little bit and say how did they put that together because obviously it's it's so much of it is so seamless right and the fact that you don't pick it apart shows i think especially with something like the last of us how great a, and well put together a game it is very much so um yeah, they're just, they're just so good at what they do, aren't they? <laughs> so much so that they convince you that it just appeared like that one day. And I think that's the real trick, isn't it? You can't see, as you said, the seams of how it all fits together. Yeah, exactly. Which is incredible considering how many people likely worked on that game as well. You know, <laughs> yeah. 
there's a lot of seams. The game is just all seams, basically. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. And I look back at some of my projects and I think, well, you can definitely tell that that was two separate artists working together or two separate designers. I don't know how they do it. It's incredible. I don't know. Following someone else's creative vision is something neither of us are able to do, it seems. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, we have one final question. And you may not have an answer for this one. It depends. And that is, which game, if any game, has made you cry? Ooh. I'm going to go... I don't know if you'll have heard of it. Um, Presentable Liberty. No, please tell me more. Um, so it's a little first person indie game. It's essentially, it's kind of in a post apocalyptic world, but you, the whole, entire game takes place in a single prison cell and you receive letters. Um, one from the person that owns the prison and one from a random lady who lives nearby who owns a cake shop. And through these letters, this, I won't give anything away, but this very engaging narrative develops. And the very end of it, I was crying. Like there are no words for how hard I was crying. <laughs> I've never heard of it before. What, what was it called again? Sorry. Presentable Liberty. And where, where can I check that out? I'm going to say itch. Okay. Oh, brilliant. Oh, sounds, sounds lovely. And it's about uh, like a kind of piecing a story together through letters that are written to you. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. It's a very, very low poly kind of art style. Um, someone, I think, I couldn't confirm, but it kind of has that game jam look about it. So someone very quickly put it together in a short space of time and then later went back and polished it a little bit, I think. Right. Oh, wow. No, I have definitely have to check that out. And, and that's definitely not an answer that we've had before. I'm sure, I'm sure you, will, <laughs> you will already know that. I'm, I'm quite pleased. I managed to get one in there that no one had said before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no one's ever said Age of Empires before either. That's a great yes. answer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're almost finished up. But I guess I would just love to give you the opportunity to, you know, talk about anything that you've got going on just now. Anything you want to shout about, anything you guys have got going on at the amazing work over at Game Anglia, any initiatives that young people can get involved with, perhaps any projects that you've got up and coming, any of that lovely stuff, would love to hear more about it. Um, for Game Anglia, I'm just, I'm just going to do a, you know, a plug hunt <laughs> and I'm going to say just check out our website, gameanglia.co.uk um, because we've got some stuff upcoming and we've got some stuff that's running at the moment that may be of interest if you just want to meet some nice people or you just want to brush up on some creative skills, etc, etc. Just come, have a chat with us. We're lovely people. And if, if there's something that you're curious if we might be doing, then just ping us an email. Hello at gameanglia.co.uk. Um, but then I'm now going to be incredibly selfish and I'm just going to talk about me. <laughs> Please, this is what this is all about. Um, to be honest, I kind of uh, I haven't really developed anything for about a year, but I'm about to go back and finish my final year of my master's. So I'm quite excited for that. So, um, yeah, I've got some ideas for my thesis that I think my professors are going to be. They're going to take a deep breath after I pitch it to them, I think. <laughs> Can we hear any more? Can we hear a sneak peek of what you're, think what you're thinking about writing about? So what I'm working on is location-based VR experiences. Okay, t tell, tell me more, please. <laughs> so um, I, can't, I can't tell you too much because I'm very much in the R&D phase, so I don't know what it is yet, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, but essentially what I'm looking at is, uh, did you hear about the War of the Worlds VR experience? Um, and there's another one called Alien Zoo. And then there was Darren Brown's Ghost Train that was at Thorpe Park, I think. Right. I think I know the kind of thing you mean. Um, yeah. I have an inkling anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you strap on a VR headset and if it's a kind of more uh, well-funded show, I suppose, you end up with a backpack that's got a computer in it. And the idea is that you can walk around and a lot of them are kind of very passive experiencing of narrative and events and things, but there are some quite cool ones where they kind of branch into the shooter genre and things. Um, but yeah, I just, I find it very interesting. So um, hopefully watch this space. Mm, very interesting. <laughs> Lots of interesting stuff in that kind of space for sure. And sure, surely they don't need their computers in their backs now. They can use like the, the Oculus Quest or um, something like that, right? They can, but I can't afford that kind of tech. <laughs> <laughs> Just look, I got your computer in your backpack. Yeah, a massive, just the really, really big towers. <laughs> and some sunglasses. Of course, yeah, yeah, you've got to look cool while you do it. <laughs> no, 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 it's a VR headset, guys. Yeah. VR. 
I mean, yeah, my uh, my very low tech version of the prototype. You know those cardboard um, VR headsets. That yeah, you can yeah, get? yeah, yeah. One of those and a tower and a backpack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, um, go on, please. I was just going to say that's that's literally the only interesting things about my life. Um, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> no, lots of interesting stuff there for sure. And lots of ways that people can get in touch with you. And I really do implore anyone who's listening to get in touch if you're in East Anglia. You know, I was actually, um, I grew up in East Anglia. Did you? Yeah, yeah. A little town called Sudbury in Suffolk. No. Yeah. Oh. I haven't been there in a long time though. What, what's it like out in East Anglia now? I'd imagine it's much the same as it ever was, just there's more people now. <laughs> um, but Sudbury specifically, I, I know that the duck pond is good because um, by chance I happened to be over there <laughs> a couple of weeks ago um, with a friend who's got children. Um, yeah, I wasn't just visiting the ducks on my own. But that might be a good idea when we can. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to know. Good to know my old stomping ground still, uh, oh, yeah. still alive and kicking. Still full of wonderfully bonkers people. That um, makes sense. <laughs> well, I think we'll leave it there. I, I honestly can't thank you enough, Heather. It was really, really great to chat to you. And, you know, hopefully lots of really, really useful stuff there for any young person who's interested in getting into games and wants some great advice. Any young person who's out in East Anglia who wants to get involved with any of the great projects and initiatives that you guys have uh, uh, going on. And, you know, hopefully a bit of a laugh too. Yeah, fingers crossed. Thank you very much for having me. It's been lovely to meet you and chat to you about some stuff. Brilliant. No, and you too. And I, I'm not sure when we'll be back for another one of these episodes, probably next month. I'm, I'm not sure. But either way, check out on intergames.org website or the Getting Into Games podcast on Spotify. And, you know, Millicent on, on the Intergames Twitter will have much more updated information than me about when you can expect the next episode. I just record them. I don't know any of that stuff. <laughs> But honestly, thank you so much again, Heather, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Thank you.